Uh, good afternoon to everyone who has joined us for this Australian Government webinar on geographical indications. My name is Margaret Trigertha and I'm the Deputy Director General of Policy and Corporate here in IP Australia. Firstly, I'd like to open by acknowledging the traditional custodians of the lands on which we're meeting today. For those of us in Canberra, the Ngunnawal people, and extend my respect to their elders past and present. And I'd like to extend that uh, respect to any Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islanders who are joining us today. Some housekeeping. Uh, for, for today's event, we'll be taking questions through Slido at the link that's available on the screen there. And the event code is hash GIW. And if I could just ask to make it easier for us in terms of answering questions, if you could identify yourself either in the Slido app or, or within the question itself, that would be really helpful. Um, by way of introduction, uh, in June 2018, the Australian Government launched important negotiations for a comprehensive and ambitious free trade agreement with the European Union. This particular consultation seeks industry, business and community views on the type of system changes that may be considered in the event a negotiated outcome gives rise to changes to the way we currently protect GIs. Importantly, the government has made no commitment to protect specific EU GIs. It would only consider doing so if the overall FTA deal was good enough for Australia, including on delivering um, on Australia's agricultural market access. Today, you'll hear from representatives from the Department of Foreign Affairs and Trade and IP Australia, who will provide an overview of the consultation process and answer any questions that you may have. So without further delay, I'd like to introduce Jan Hutton from DFAT, the Deputy Chief Negotiator of the FTA. Over to you, Jan. Thanks very much, Margaret. Um, look, what I wanted to do briefly today uh, in the time we have is just to give a bit of context to the EU Australia EU Free Trade Agreement, and then just a short update on where we are at in the negotiations. So, most of you uh, on the line, I'm sure, are aware that Australia's economic success has always been very closely tied to our success as a trading nation. Australia already has a very large network of free trade agreements with almost all of our major trading partners. The EU is already Australia's third largest trade and investment partner. Um, it represents a market of almost half a billion people um, with a GDP of over $15 trillion. So not surprisingly, Australia has very significant interests in this FTA. We, of course, want to improve access for our exports into that very large and prosperous EU market. We want to boost our services trade um, and we want to underpin the already significant two-way foreign direct investment flows. Uh, like any negotiation, in order to secure the things that we want to get out of this negotiation, we need to engage the EU on its interests um, and that includes geographical indications. Before I come to the EU's interests on GIs, I did just want to say a word or two about market access. Uh, and really present a, a few facts um, uh, or, or put into context the existing environment. So many of you on the call again, I'm sure are aware that Australia's existing access into the EU market is limited for some of our exports, particularly our agricultural exports. We haven't had that access improved since the multilateral Uruguay round of negotiations, which was more than 20 years ago. We know the EU only improves access to its market through the negotiation of free trade agreements. And we also are aware that many of our exporters are at a competitive disadvantage compared to some of their competitors in third country markets who have already concluded a free trade agreement with the EU, so have that preferential access into the EU market. And that will, of course, be exacerbated as the EU continues to negotiate new free trade agreements with other trading partners. So coming back to the issue of GIs, the EU has been very clear all along about its interests in GIs. 
I should say those interests aren't unique to Australia. The EU has pursued its GI interests in all of its free trade agreements, uh, including uh, pending negotiations. Um, I would note that the EU has managed to secure outcomes on some of its GI proposals in all of its recent FTA negotiations. So what are we talking about? The EU has asked Australia to protect 172 food and agricultural terms and 236 spirit terms. Some of you would be aware that the Australian government ran a public objections process towards the end of last year, seeking uh, objections or your views on those specific terms. Now, one thing that I really can't emphasise enough, and I'm sure you'll hear us repeat ourselves over and over again uh, in this forum and throughout the consultations, is the very clear message from the Australian government and the Trade Minister in particular that Australia has not agreed to protect any GI terms in this negotiations and will not agree to do so until later in the negotiations and if the overall deal is good enough. And that includes securing new commercially significant market access for Australian agricultural products. So back to this consultation to explain what this consultation is. We focused on GI terms uh, last year this consultation is really uh, seeking your input on the key questions and issues we would need to consider were Australia to decide to establish our own GI system. And we want to start thinking about those issues now to make sure that any decision to do so, we, we are able to design a system that is in the best interests of Australia and is informed by the views of our businesses, industries and consumers. So just a quick word on where we're at in the negotiations. Uh, we just finished at the end of last week our eighth round of negotiations. The COVID-19 pandemic hasn't slowed down our negotiations. If anything, it's made us more determined to conclude those negotiations as soon as we are able. Um, they'll be an important um, pillar of our uh, economic recovery efforts. What it has done, of course, is changed the way in which we negotiate. So this last negotiating round and the main negotiating round before that, we conducted virtually. For us, that means uh, two weeks, I think, of something like uh, in excess of 65 um, VTCs with the European Union. The next negotiation uh, is in December, and of course, we're both keen to keep the tempo of those negotiations up going forward with that goal of concluding a comprehensive and ambitious free trade agreement uh, as soon as we are able. That's it from me. Thanks, Margaret. Thanks, Jan. Uh, our next speaker is Brendan Burke from IP Australia, who manages the geographical indications team. Brendan? Thanks, Margaret. Um, I just wanted to run through um, a bit about the consultation and the process. Um, just start off by firstly defining what a geographical indication is. Um, most people who have taken the time to register, I'm sure, are familiar, but a, a GI identifies a good as originating in a specific region and also it's where a, a particular quality reputation or a, a characteristic of the good is essentially attributable to that geographic origin. And some examples of GIs are there on the screen in front of you. One is Australian wild abalone is um, an Australian GI and Champagne and Darjeeling tea are a couple of famous international GIs. So how do we currently protect GIs? Um, Australia has two systems for registering GIs. We have the certification trademark system um, administered by IP Australia. Some examples of GIs protected under that system are Stilton and Parmigiano Reggiano are protected as certification trademarks. Um, Scotch whiskey and tequila are a couple of other examples. There's also the wine GI system, which was implemented. Um, it implements the wine agreement between Australia and the EU. It protects um, both Australian and European GIs and it's been well used by Australian industry. And there's also a food standards code. The Australian New Zealand food standards code provides some additional restrictions on GIs for spirits. 
and there have been some examples where that's been enforced against fake Scotch whisky, for example. Um, additional to that, of course, is that Australia's consumer law provides general protection against misleading and deceptive conduct, which could also apply to use of GIs. Um, so why are we consulting? Um, as Jan mentioned, if we, if we agree to protect European GIs, we're likely to need to amend our law. And also, if we need to do that, we really want to get an idea um, from you, from Australian stakeholders, on what, whether there would be benefits for Australian producers and consumers in implementing a GI system and what sort of features we would need to do that. So the consultation, we'll, we've got a, published a consultation paper on our website. It sets out a number of key elements of a possible Australian GI right. And these are set out there um, on the screen, registration, standard of protection, use and enforcement. So if registration, the list of European GIs will be dealt with through the free trade agreement. But we would also develop a system that allows for new applications for GIs from Australians or from other countries. And so we would set out a system that has um, processes similar to other IP rights, such as examination and opposition. The standard of protection sets out the limit of what can be protected um, and what sort of things are prevented by registration of a GI. In terms of use, we're interested in stakeholder views on who can own a GI and who can um, use a GI or who can apply for a GI is probably better than saying who can own it. And enforcement is really what mechanisms are available for enforcing a GI. So the consultation papers on our website, um, that goes into more detail on each of those elements. So I encourage you to have a look at that paper if you haven't already. We are also running a number of roundtables um, virtually to get into some of the details of some of these issues. Um, the first one will be on standard of protection. The second one's the Australian use of GIs and that's where we want to explore again um, what interest there is from Australian producers in protecting GIs and what sort of features would be required the third round table is on the general operation, so just more of the nuts and bolts about the process, um, examination, registration, etc. And the final one is on GIs and Indigenous knowledge. And again, that's kind of to test the water to see if there are ways we can do this that provide benefits that um, Indigenous Australians can use to get involved in supply chains and protect their Indigenous knowledge. So if you're interested in any of those roundtables, you can register at our website. We've currently got um, one roundtable for each of those, but if there's sufficient interest, we'll look at holding additional roundtables. Thank you. Thanks, Brendan. And so we're going to move now into the main part of the, the session today, which is an opportunity for you all to ask questions. Before we do that, I'll just introduce the other members of our panel. So we have Lauren Henschke, also from DFAT, sitting next to Jan, and uh, Troy McGregor from the Department of Industry, Science, Energy and Resources, sitting next to Brendan. So Slido, I believe, is open. And um, we'll just give it a moment, and the team will bring up some questions. The process will be that I'll, um, I'll read out the question um, to give the team the chance to work out who's best placed to answer it and then we'll throw to, to the person best placed to answer that question. So look, while we're waiting perhaps, I might just um, kick off with a question that some people might have, um, which is um, why we're considering creating a new GI right instead of using or reforming existing GI protection systems. Is that one perhaps for you, Brendan? Yeah, thanks, Margaret. Uh, yeah, um, in terms of our current system, 
the European Union are, are asking for a number of also a number of terms they're seeking to protect. They're also looking for rules around how those terms are protected. Um, we thought that would be best done through a, a new GI right rather than making changes to the certification trademark system, which may affect existing rights. And um, we thought that would be the most efficient way to implement um, a new right. I've got a question here from Jocelyn Bossy. Uh, has DFAT and or IP Australia made any efforts to consult with Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander communities on the FTA beyond the round tables? I don't know if anyone wants to pick that one up. Jan? Uh, thanks very much for your question. Uh, yes, is the, the short answer. Um, so for these FTA negotiations, um, the government is genuinely committed to uh, ongoing consultations um, with everyone who has an interest in this FTA. There's a number of mechanisms to do that. Uh, this existing consultation is simply one of those. Um, I note Brendan already had up on the screen the dedicated uh, roundtable that's coming up on GIs and Indigenous knowledge. So for those of you who are interested in that is issue, uh, I certainly encourage you uh, to tune into that one. Um, but GIs is only one of the issues in the FTAs uh, that uh, our Indigenous communities have an interest in. There's a number of other issues. I won't go through them all, but absolutely, um, we are very keen to hear from uh, Indigenous stakeholders and Indigenous communities. Is there anything you wanted to add to that, Brendan, from the IP Australia point of view? No, uh, Jan has covered off the FTA. IP Australia has been consulting Indigenous Australians on um, IP generally. We've got an, an Indigenous knowledge project, which we've got quite a bit of information up on our webpage about. Um, and this, this consultation we're doing here um, complements that. So. Just turning to a question there from Trent, um, if a submission has been made via the last process, so that I think perhaps is the public objection process, um, is it important to submit another one to this process? I'm happy to answer that one. Um, the last process, the public objections process, I think is probably uh, what this uh, question is focused on. Um, we have conveyed all of the objections we receive from you as part of that process to the EU as part of the negotiations and we'll continue to do that. The public objections process was focused specifically on GI terms, but some of you did take the opportunity to tell us that some of the concerns you had on specific GI terms was linked uh, in part at least to the way in which uh, the EU is asking us to protect those terms. So if you took the opportunity to convey uh, your views in that forum um, on those issues, then rest assured we do have those and we've taken those into consideration. Um, but of course, we remain interested uh, uh, to hear those views again, to hear views from others who didn't take that opportunity to raise those specific sets of issues. Uh, I think looking at the next question, what happened to the objections process, uh, again, just I mentioned we have conveyed all of those responses to the EU as part of the FTA negotiations. Mm. Thanks, Margaret. Thanks. So I think that the message there is that if you have provided information, be assured we have that information and it's part of informing our response, but we would welcome anything additional on the specific issues around the GI right creation issues that we're talking here about or any further or additional concerns about particular terms as well. Um, so just looking across to our next question, what would a new GI right mean for GIs currently protected in Australia? Brenda, did you, did you want to take that? Sure. The, the intention is that those GIs would continue um, to exist in their current form. Um, the new GI system wouldn't affect those. Um, if, if they're registered as certification trademarks, then it's up to the owner of those to decide whether they want to maintain that trademark if, if the same GI is also sought under the new system um, and GIs protected under the wine system would continue to operate as they do now. Okay. Um, just while we're waiting for other questions to come through, I might um, 
ask about pre-existing trademarks. So how would a GI system affect pre-existing trademarks that include GI terms? Brendan, if you want to respond to that. Thanks. Um, obviously with the European list, that was one of the um, questions or one of the grounds of objection that was raised. So those will be considered in the context of um, the FDA. For any new applications that are filed, obviously they will be one of the grounds of um, examination and objection will be whether there is a prior trademark right. So it will continue that um, first in time principle. So if there's a prior trademark, um, that will be a, a valid consideration when we're looking at registration of any new GI. Thanks. So there's a question about what support's going to be available for small communities through the process. Shan, did you want to take that? Uh, thanks again for your question. Look, what we are really hoping is that through this FTA, we deliver opportunities for uh, all of Australia's rural and regional communities right across the country. Um, and in fact, the government will only uh, do a deal where we are providing those benefits for Australians. So um, talking more specifically about GIs, part of this consultation uh, is we're interested to hear from you small communities, regional communities, um, your interests in GIs. Um, we are, of course, looking at whether there are Australian GIs that we would like to uh, pursue as part of these FTA negotiations. And uh, through this consultation and through the broader FTA negotiations, we, of course, continue to want to hear from you the impact on you, whether you're a community, whether you're a small business, whether you're an industry, of what some of the issues uh, we're looking at in the negotiations are. Thanks. Our next question is about an application process um, for GIs. Brendan, did you want to speak to that? Um, yeah, in, in terms of application processes, what we would be looking at is the processes are similar to other IP rights in that um, a person um, applies for a GI and that person would need to be a, a legal body such as a natural person or a body a company or a collection of um, producers would get together and apply for a GI with IP Australia. It would then go through um, an examination process, be open to opposition processes, um, similar to the trademark system in many respects and before registration. And our next question um, from Helen Thomas. Uh, thanks, Helen. Uh, has there been a consideration given or decision made so far on how the GI system might be enforced? Um, for example, through the ACCC or a body such as Wine Australia. Um, yeah, it's certainly one of the issues we've been looking at. Um, we would... the model we've put out in the paper would allow for the um, the right holder to take action and we're one of the questions we're specific, sorry, specifically asked views for is um, what other enforcement actions should be available. So that's something we're particularly interested in hearing from people about. And there is, as Brendan mentioned, a specific round table on enforcement. So if that's an area of particular interest for you, please do sign up for that round table where we can dig into the detail of the enforcement issue. Um, question around cost, um, how much a new GI system is going to cost Australian taxpayers? I reckon, Jan, did you want to respond to that? Yeah, sure. Um, look, the short answer is we don't know. And the reason we don't know is because we haven't decided uh, to actually create a new GI system. So what we're doing at the moment is essentially looking at all of the threshold questions and issues we would need to consider were the government to decide to create a GI system. Um, of course, 
if a decision is made to do that, then consideration would need to be given to how that system will be funded. Um, I'll be very clear, as the EU has been clear with us, that it expects Australia to protect its GIs without charging fees. Um, but to be very frank, that's not something that we have agreed to at this stage of the negotiations. Thank you. Um, and will the uh, NIS cl classification be used for goods in the new system? Um, is that something that we're looking at, Brendan? Yeah, that's certainly something that we're looking at very closely. Um, whether it makes sense to use NIS, there's some benefits in that and it allows a single register to be searched for GIs and trademarks, but um, or whether we use a more specific um, product category thing. Thanks. Uh, there's a question about whether, as part of the process, we would intend to accede to the Lisbon Agreement. Is that something that you're able to respond to there? You take that one, Brendan? Yeah, it's not something we're looking through through this process. That would be a separate a separate issue for Australia. Okay, um, so I've got a question there, just wanting a bit more detail about the outcomes of the objection process. So we've heard that that those submissions on the objections were passed through to the EU as part of our negotiation process, and then what happens next? Um, look, thanks again for that question. Uh, yes, just to reiterate that point, um, we have passed uh, or discussed, in fact, all of the objections we received from you as part of the public objections process. The public objections process was a very formal process uh, to seek objections on specific GI terms the EU has asked us to protect, um, but it wasn't a, a set and forget process. So what the public objections process did for us as negotiators, it really uh, informed our knowledge um, on which terms Australia cares most about, uh, how we use those terms in the Australian market and overseas markets. Um, and so we are in a much better position uh, in the negotiations to really prosecute the interests of Australian producers, consumers and industry. But what I would say is we continue to want to have that very close engagement with you. We continue to want to hear from you uh, even more how EU proposals on GIs um, will affect your interests. So it was one part uh, of the process, um, but it's certainly not something we've, we've done, ticked that box and moved on from. Thanks, Jan. So there's a question about country of origin labelling and how this is different to that. Perhaps, Troy, you might be able to help us with that. That one? <coughs> Excuse me. Um, the country of origin labelling system is a domestic labelling system which is designed to give consumers information about the origin of the foods in particular, the, which was expressed through the consultation process to develop it, to the Australian content of those goods. Um, this would be different, obviously, to a... And, th and that, I should say from the outset, is that system for foods and um, beverages is, uh, is free to use. Um, the GI system is, and I'm not the expert on the GI system itself, but if, if one was to produce, that is a, this, this is an IP right, which is based on the characteristics of goods in relation to a particular geography. And that's somewhat different to what a country of origin labeling system has been set up to do. Ben, did you want to add anything to that? Yeah, I think Troy touched on it in that last part. A, a, a GI isn't just a badge of origin, there also has to be um, some characteristic or, or reputation that is essentially attributable to its origin. Uh, so there's a question about um, whether or not the, the current three systems are going to remain. So you will recall that Brendan at the beginning of the pre presentation talked about certified trademarks, existing GIs and the wine sort of system and GIs is going to be an additional method of protection. Is that the current thinking, Brendan? Um, that's the current thinking. In, in the consultation paper, we do briefly touch on whether there may be um, in future opportunity to rational, um, combine some of those systems, but 
um, in terms of our currently what we're initially proposing is a system that would be an extra system, but it, it should be flexible enough to give us that policy fl flexibility in the future. Yeah, I think there's a, um, just to follow up there around complexity. So, you know, will this addition of an additional right uh, increase complexity rather than making it easier for people to, to engage with the protection? So um, I think Brendan touched on there, there is a, that, that's something that would be really interesting to hear from uh, communities and business groups on, like what do you think about that as an issue? Um, but in terms of that issue in particular, Brendan, I don't know that, whether you wanted to make any comment about the increasing complexity of adding an additional right. Yeah, um, certainly, I guess in terms of that, we're interested in hearing from people on what the complexities in the current systems are and whether we can avoid some of those if we if we do create a new GI right. And um, certainly we, we would want to make this as simple as possible while also still maintaining rigour around what is protected. Margaret, if I might just yeah. jump in to add to that question of complexity. So, of course, any GI system that Australia decides to create would have to uh, take into account any negotiated outcomes on GIs in the EU FTA, but Australia will remain free to decide how we operationalise those outcomes. Um, and really that's what this consultation is about, focusing on how would we design an Australian GI system um, that best served our interests. Um, and that's what we're really interested to hear views from you on, on what makes the most sense for Australia, um, knowing that we would, of course, need to accommodate any outcomes uh, that arose from the FTA. Thanks, Jan. There's a question about um, how GIs might operate sort of together, where you might have a, a product that would fit potentially within two registered GIs. Um, is that something that could be possible under the new system that we might design? Is that um, something that businesses might want or would it cr increase complexity? So I think we'd be interested to hear from people about what you think about that. Um, Brendan, is there anything you wanted to add to that? Um, yeah, um, under the wine system, a, a, a particular wine might fall into this type of category. For example, it might fall in the GI for Barossa Valley might apply along with South Australia and there's also a GI for Australia. So there is a um, cascading tier of GIs. So I assume that under this system, a similar outcome could be achievable depending on how people want to market their products. But again, um, we're interested in views on that. Thanks, Brendan. Um... So the next question is um, about the negotiation. So have there been any trade-off for Australian GIs being protected in Europe? Um, Lauren? Yeah, thanks, Margaret. Um, we're still considering whether to propose Australian GIs in the context of the negotiations. As you're aware, the EU has um, provided us with a list of terms that they want protected. Um, and we're still considering whether or what kind or how we would be uh, submitting any Australian GIs for protection within the context of the FTA. I think also, um, so the FTA will establish this list of terms or specific GIs, it will also be establishing um, standards around the protection of those terms. And I think we can also remember that it is possible for Australians to apply within the EU system to protect GIs currently within their existing system. So the FTA is not the only channel, but these are things that we're open to and we welcome um, submissions or comments um, around uh, interest in proposing Australian GIs. Thanks. Thank you. Thanks, Lauren. Uh, there's a question about the interaction between certification marks um, and geographical indicators and whether you'd be able to sort of transfer or apply for an additional one. Take that. Thanks. Um, 
another good question, another one we've been thinking about. Um, if it's something people are interested in doing, um, how could we do that in a way that um, reduces the burden on people to do that? Certainly, there, it's something we're interested in looking at further. Um, there are advantages to certification trademarks and possible advantages to GIs, so it may be that people want one or both of those. Um, so we're certainly interested in looking at what, how we can um, enable people to get the most suitable protection um, for their for their commercial businesses. Thanks, Brendan. So I've got a specific question about a specific uh, GI term there, Prosecco. Um, who's best place, Jan? Uh, Prosecco. So. Uh, that's uh, a term that we have absolutely heard the very strong views of Australian stakeholders and how important Prosecco is to them, uh, Australian industry, individual businesses and indeed the Australian economy. We heard that, we've heard that throughout the negotiations. Um, so rest assured uh, that message is very, very clear to us. Uh, we continue to think the wine agreement serves our interests well, serves both ours and the EU's interests well, and we have asked the EU to continue to respect the terms of the wine agreement. That is one of the reasons why we didn't include Prosecco in the public objections process that we ran at the end of last year. I was just, I was just gonna say to be crystal clear that at this stage, um, wine is not part of the FTA. Um, and, and as Jan said, that's why it wasn't included in the public objections process. Thanks. Thanks. Next question is about uh, comparison with New Zealand, um, uh, whether it would make sense for our systems to be similar given the, the closeness between the countries. Is that something for you, Jan? Yeah. I'll tackle it first of all, and then if um, uh, Brendan and Troy have anything to add, please feel free to jump in. So the first point I'd make is uh, just as we're negotiating an FTA with the EU, New Zealand is also negotiating an FTA with the EU. They are separate negotiations. Um, Australia has different interests in uh, the negotiations to New Zealand, so we're very much running those negotiations separately. Um, we are aware, of course, that the EU has similar GI interests with New Zealand uh, to Australia, as it does with all of its FTA partners, as I said at the beginning. Um, and of course, we're aware that there are, are crossover issues, and many of you, uh, the concerns you have are both for Australia in the Australian market and in New Zealand. Um, because the stage we're at in the negotiations where we haven't agreed to any GI terms, nor uh, agreed to any of the ways the EU's asked us to protect those terms, we're not yet at the point where it would make sense for us to uh, work closely with New Zealand. We are pursuing our own individual interests. Um, but at some point, yes, absolutely, we will need to uh, talk to New Zealand and make sure that we uh, are looking at things that make sense for both of us and, ser and serve both of our interests. Yeah, um, Jan's covered that pretty well. I just add that you know, some industries have said to us that they do use common branding across Australia and New Zealand, so that is something we're conscious of as well. Thanks for that. We don't currently have any um, additional questions there. So if you did have a question you wanted to ask, I'd really encourage you to send that in now. And while we're waiting to see whether we do have any final questions, I might just throw to the panel and see if there's any concluding remarks or key issues. Oh, they've got another question in there. Uh, so before I throw to final remarks, I'll just ask this one, which is about cheese. Will, will we be able to get our brie into Paris? So that's a exciting thought. Uh, so we're trying to get to the, the, the nuts of this question. I think what the question is really getting to is the market access side. Um, look, all I can say is uh, the, the Trade Minister, Minister Birmingham, cannot be any clearer in saying that we haven't agreed to any GI terms. 
we won't agree to any GI terms until later in the negotiations and only if the overall deal is good enough. And that includes new commercially significant market access for Australia. Thanks, Jan. All right, so I might then ask the panel uh, if there's anything in conclusion you'd like to say to wrap up. Perhaps, Troy, is there anything you'd like to add? No, that's good. Brendan, is there anything you'd like to conclude with? No, I'd, I'd just encourage people to have a look at the consultation paper and there is, there's a series of questions in there or there's a, a shorter survey, but if, if there are other issues that aren't in the paper, we're also interested that you think are important, we're also interested in hearing about those. Jan? Uh, thanks, Margaret. Look, just from me, just to say thanks for the large number uh, of people who have taken the time out of their busy day uh, to join us today. Um, we do really appreciate your engagement in this process. Um, we are really keen to continue to engage you, both on GIs, but also other issues in the FTA. There's a large number of mechanisms and ways in which you can do that. Um, and of course, we're always more than happy to hear from you directly. Thanks, Margaret. Thanks, Jan. So I'll just reiterate that um, thanks. Um, we know that there's a lot going on for people at this moment in time, and we do appreciate you taking the time to join us. For those who couldn't join us, perhaps colleagues that you may know who are interested, uh, we will uh, make available the slides and the recording of this webinar so people can look at it later. And we really do encourage you to engage. There's a range of ways, as we've said. There's the round tables. There's the um, invitation to make submissions in writing. And there's also a telephone number on our uh, consultation website page. Um, so many ways uh, which you can use to engage with us. And again, I probably just say again, as Jan said, you've heard this before, but I think it's important to make it clear that the purpose of this consultation is to get some views in relation to the way we might implement GIs if uh, there is a decision to do so in the context of the agreement as a whole. So that's a really important point to bear in mind that I thought I would close with. But thank you very much for joining us and we look forward to further engagement on this issue. Thanks.